Now, is there a line of commandment? Uh, first of all, a disclaimer. I, I'm not uh, going to be preaching any uh, preaching teaching any uh, any new doctrine. Okay. And uh, I could have titled this um, a new commandment, but uh, I thought this was more uh, enticing and would get you thinking. Since the the Ten Commandments is a central part of our doctrine. Uh, is that all there is? You know? <laughs> is there is there what we might be able to, you know, say eleventh commandment or a new commandment? And uh, if you turn to Romans thirteen or verse eight, please. Romans thirteen. And verse eight. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So we see here that Paul sums up the last five commandments. But with the uh, with the phrase, you, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, the fifth commandment, of course, to uh, honor your mother and father, also involves love. And it's a commandment that we are to honor our mother and father. And even if uh, if it's if it's uh, not out of love, we are still in, in, because maybe our one of our parents was very abusive. Uh, we are, you know, we are still to honor them in terms of uh, as long as they are not telling us to do something that is immoral or what. But in any event, we are to forgive them and we are to to honor them in, in terms of uh, uh, being our parents. And that, and and most of the time, of course, that would come out, out of love. And of course, the first four commandments are to love God with all our hearts and with all our minds. So love is at the uh, at the core of all this. Mm -hmm. But the last five is to love your neighbor as yourself. And the word that's used there is uh, for love is agapo, agapo. And agapo is uh, is used pro just as more than agape, I would say. I didn't add it all up, but you know, we're always talking about agape love. But agapo is used, if not as much, but I would say more from what I saw in the concordance. And uh, agapo is where 25 of the concordance is to love in a social or moral sense. It's unconditional. Uh, you, you're to love in a, so, from a, in a social or moral sense. So, so to love your neighbor as yourself, you have a social duty to love your neighbor. Because he was created, he, she was created in the image of God. And you have a moral sense to love your neighbor because God has said that that is, that is right that, and he's commanded us to do it. And that, uh, so uh, we love, agape love, we love our neighbor in a social or moral sense. And uh, this is not a new idea though. Uh, if you turn to Leviticus 19, Leviticus 19, this is not a new pronouncement. Uh, Leviticus 19 and verse 18. Here, uh, God says, You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So here we have the principle of love your neighbor as yourself. But I think here it's more in the context of uh, the kingdom of Israel and the people that are in the kingdom. Uh, but uh, again, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So this is not new. But if we go to uh, John 13 now, John 13 and verse 34. John 13 and verse 34. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you. And notice the words new and commandment. 
that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So here we see a new commandment. Well, what's different about it? Well, Jesus is telling us to love others as he has loved us. And that is a higher form of love than to love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, it's, it's the same word, though. It's the same word, agapo. But it's a higher love as we're loving people as Jesus loved us. Not just loving our neighbor as we would love ourselves, but coming from, coming from the perspective of self. But this is coming from, from the perspective of Jesus and Jesus living in us uh, through uh, the Holy Spirit. Now, now notice, it's a, a commandment. <laughs> We take the word commandment seriously, don't we? Yes. yes. <laughs> it's a commandment. So that means we're, we're, to, we're, we're supposed to do it. But you might say, well, how? How? How can I love others as Jesus loved me? How can I do that? Well, Jesus is going to show us how to do that. And uh, does Jesus have any authority to create a commandment? Yes. Or the command? Who was the Who was the... Uh, who was the God who uh, gave the Ten Commandments to, uh, to Moses on Mount Sinai? Jesus. Jesus, right? Yes. The Word. Yes. He was the Word who became Jesus. Yes. He was the one who gave the Ten Commandments. Does he have authority to give another commandment? <laughs> <laughs> and what did Jesus say? He does nothing without the Father telling him. He says nothing without the Father telling him. He tells him what to say, he tells him what to do. So we need to take to take this take this serious. It's not a it's not a suggestion. It's a commandment. <clears throat> if we turn to uh, 1 John 3 1 John 3 in verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So when we obey God, we receive blessings from God. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Again, the word's commandment. This is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, as God's commandment also, God the Father, and love one another as Christ gave us commandment. So we have to really uh, understand that this is a, a commandment and not a suggestion. Amen. Amen. So how do we love others as Jesus loved us? Well, we can look to the life of Jesus, of course, and we know that Jesus... He healed many people out of love. He cast out demons. He resurrected people from the dead. He forgave sins. He served others. But how does that help us? Can we cast out demons? Can we resurrect people from the dead? Certainly we can forgive sins. Can we heal people? You know, did you ever, did you ever think about see somebody in a wheelchair or Gary in the nursing home, the thought would come to you that, or, or a little prayer, Lord, I wish that I could lay my hands on Gary, or that I could lay my hands on this person in the wheelchair, and you would heal them. You would heal them for me. Did you ever have, have a thought like that? Or somebody, you see somebody in the street that's blind, oh, oh Lord, I wish I could. I'd like to lay my, if I, I wish I could lay my hands on them and you would heal them through me. And why, does, uh, why can't we do that? Well, uh, maybe we don't have enough faith. <laughs> maybe we don't have a faith. Or probably this is not how God is working 
in, 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 in these days, uh, he's working differently. Uh, he's answering prayer, but it, he's not using other people to do, to do miracles at this time in his name. But there will be a time in the future when there will be miracles being done by uh, God's uh, people. So, uh, so how? So we see an example of Jesus and serving others, but certainly we can't do the things that Jesus does. We we don't have the power. Maybe we do. Okay, but we all have the faith. I don't know. You know, maybe we have to think about that. Um, but uh, Jesus certainly uh, gave us teachings and parables on how to love others as he loved us. Now, now, of course, some of the parables are hard to understand, but others are, are not. And uh, some he even explained to his disciples. Let's take a look at the, uh, Luke 10 and the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, I know you probably know that parable inside and out, but let's, let's just look at it again, and uh, I'm sure we'll get something, um, some deeper meaning, hopefully. Uh, Luke 10, Luke 10, because these are parables for us. It gives us information on how we are to love others as Jesus loved us. Of course, we can't do it without the Holy Spirit. You can't, you can't love others as Jesus loved you without the Holy Spirit. But remember, if you have the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ is living in you. He's living in you. And you have the fruit of the Spirit. To, uh, to access. So Luke 10, verse 35, what can we learn from the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan? Luke 10, 25. So it all started because a certain lawyer stood up and tested Jesus, saying, you know, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what's written? And he said, uh, well, he decided the commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said, yeah, you answered rightly. Do this, and, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And, uh, you know, because in the Old Covenant, uh, your neighbor was uh, someone that uh, lived near you, or someone that was one of, one of the tribes, or someone... Uh, or some of the outside tribes that came and they came in to live with the Israelites and they were obeying their laws and, and uh, they were converted uh, to the, the, the religion. And so, um, you know, they, I'm sure they didn't see the uh, outside peoples who they were at war with as their, uh, as their neighbors or hostile uh, Canaanites or... Uh, Philistines, as they, uh, that, they, that they were to love their neighbor, included them. So here, here he says, uh, who's my neighbor? And then Jesus said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now we don't know who this man is. We don't know if he's a Jew. We don't know if he's a Samaritan. We don't know what tribe he's from, or if any. All we know is that he was attacked and he left him half dead and he stripped him of his clothing. Now by chance a certain priest came down the road and when he saw him he passed on the other side. Likewise Levi when he arrived at the place came and looked and passed by on the other side. So th this is, um, these are people that you would expect would stop and help but they didn't. They didn't. And uh, how many of us would stop if someone, if we saw someone on uh, lying on the street in Manhattan and uh, that's happened before. What have what people, people done? They just walk by and they look and they just keep walking, you know. And, uh, you know, they, they, who knows how long they, 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 lie, they would be lying there. Because the idea is, oh, let somebody else handle it, you know. Uh, so there's a lot of people here. Oh, the police are here somewhere. Somebody, a priest will come by. <laughs> a Levi will come by. They'll do something. Um, so compassion, compassion. This is a story of compassion. Mm -hmm. But a certain uh, Samaritan, as he journeyed, came from, ha he came from where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Here's a Samaritan, 
And we don't know if this was uh, a Jew or not that was uh, in need, but it didn't matter. Christ said, it doesn't matter. Love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't matter if you're white, you're black. It doesn't matter what religion you're, you know, what your doctrine is. All those things don't matter. Uh, you're of the human race. Uh, anybody is your neighbor. Anybody that's in need is your neighbor. Yes. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds. He poured on oil and wine, and he sent him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And most of them would say, well, that, that's enough, right? <laughs> I, I found you there, I picked you up, I took, put you on my animal, I took you to the inn, and, uh, and now I'm, uh, I'm gonna let the innkeeper take, take care of you, you know? And now I'm gonna go on my way, and, and I, did, I did my part, but no. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, to denarii. He gave them to the innkeeper, and he said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So he went beyond the love your neighbor as yourself, right? He, he went beyond that. He made sure that this man would be taken care of by the innkeeper, and he said, Look, Whatever you spend, when I come by, I will reimburse you for it. So then Jesus says, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Yes. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. So yes. from this parable, we could see that how we are to love others as Jesus loved us is by having compassion on people, by having showing mercy to people. And it makes me so sad uh, to hear about the, what happened today with John, with Jim, with, with John Carnegie and, and Delicia and the deaths of their family. And, uh, you know, it, your, your heart should, should be sad and, and uh, should be praying for them. And, uh, you know, it just should be something that is not, is not just something, okay, that's it, you know, and then you don't think about it anymore. But uh, this idea of compassion, and when you have the Holy Spirit of God, that love, the love of God in you, just gives you that compassion for people. You're reading the paper, and you get so sad, you're hearing about somebody's tragedy, and what's going on in the world. And you know, you're just traveling every day. You see people suffering, people suffering. Uh, people could hardly walk, some people, uh, older people, maybe canes, wheelchairs, one leg, uh, have maybe mental conditions, loneliness. So people are suffering every day, every day in this, in this evil world. And we need to have compassion and we need to have mercy on people. And when people are in need, we need to help them if we can. So that's one example of how we are to love others as Jesus loved us. And Jesus gave us this parable. Now, a, a story that Jesus gave us that also helps us to love others as he loved us is in John 8, 1 11. John 8, uh, 1 11. One, John 8. Now the women caught in adultery. Oh, I've heard this a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take another look at it and uh, see what we could, uh, we could get out of it. Uh, that's a little deeper, maybe. Um, John 8, 1 to 11. So, uh, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. When they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Well, you wonder, where's the man? All right. <laughs> where's the man, right? If she's caught in the act. He's gotta, the man's got to be there, right? And so, <laughs> where's the man? Now Moses and the Lord commanded us that such should be stoned. 
But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. Because if he said, no, they should, no it's not stone here, you have well, the law of Moses, you're going against the law of Moses. Uh, but uh, Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Now we don't know if he was just scribbling on the ground, or maybe he was writing something on the ground. S-I-N. Sin. <laughs> maybe he's writing sin in big bold letters on the ground. But uh, so, it, so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to him, He who is without, to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And so uh, usually the first one that was supposed to throw a stone at her would, would be her closest relative or in the case where let's say uh, a son was being stoned for being uh, disobedient to parents over and over again and disrespectful, the parent was, each of the parents was supposed to throw the first stone. So he says, who is without you sin, throw a stone. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience, so we all have a conscience, right? Even people that don't have the Spirit of God. The people that don't have the Spirit of God, many times they just ignore their conscience, and after a while become seared, and uh, they don't even listen to it anymore. Uh, but they went out one by one. They were convicted, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. So probably the, the older people who had more sins, probably because they lived longer, you know, they uh, they were conv convicted and they, and they were wiser, probably. Even to the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus has raised, raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and, but she says, So you know, he said, I don't condemn you. So does that mean that uh, you know people are allowed to go and sin and just uh, and go their way? No, he said, and sin no more, sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, "I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life." So neither do I condemn you, but sin no more. Now some people will will, will misunderstand this and they'll say, "Well." Jesus didn't condemn her, so we are not to judge others. We are not to judge others. But they, they, they neglect the word condemn here, so they, they, they kind of broadly apply it. So we're not to judge others. So if somebody's sinning, um, you know, we're not to judge them. Someone's homosexual uh, and they're flouting their homosexuality, oh, we're not to judge them. You know, Jesus said, don't judge. Um, somebody's doing something wrong and sinful, uh, oh, don't judge them. But that's, so we need to uh, understand what, what, what does it mean to judge someone. And uh, if you go to uh, Matthew 7 and verse 1, but here, here of course, what, what, we're, what we're looking at is forgiveness. Forgiveness. And uh, Jesus was forgiving the, the, the woman, and, and, and if we're going to love others as Jesus loved us, we are to forgive others. Amen. We are to forgive others. And uh, Matthew 7, and uh, verse uh, 1, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So, again, many people take this as further evidence that we're not to judge anybody. We're not to, uh, you know, who are we to judge? Somebody does something bad, oh, I don't know. we're not to judge. Well, uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians 5. And verse 1. Here's Paul in uh, writing to the church in Corinth. And he says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, 
that a man has his father's wife. So here's a man in the church, and he had he's sleeping with his father's wife or his stepmother. And apparently the Corinthians uh, were not uh, really affronted enough to really deal with it. And he says, And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned? Shouldn't you be mourning that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you? For I, indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, um, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So, what we see here is that Paul is judging this man, not condemning him, though, not condemning him. He's not condemning him, saying, you're going to go to hell, uh, you'll, never, you'll never repent, you're doomed. No, he's judging He's judging the sin. He's actually judging the sin. And that's the point here. We don't judge the person, but we judge the sin. We have to judge sin. So that homosexual, we don't judge him. We don't condemn him in the sense that you're going to hell, you're no good. We, no, we, we, we pray for them. But we, we condemn the sin. God hates sin. God hates sin. And uh, so we are to hate sin, and we are to condemn sin. If the woman caught in adultery, he condemned, he condemned the sin. He didn't condemn the woman, but he condemned the sin. So they put this fellow out of the church, but in 2 Corinthians we know that they brought him back in. So he repented. He repented, and they brought him back in to the church. And that was the whole point, is that... You, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You know, it can't leave someone in a church that's openly sinning. And so a judgment was made. He was put out of the church, but then he repented and he was brought back in. So we judge the sin and not the sinner. You know, it sounds so simple, but it's so hard to understand for some people. They don't get it. I don't know. They just don't get it. They still cling to their own idea. Uh, but it's so, it's so simple, you know? Only God can condemn someone. We, we don't. We, we pray for forgiveness. We uh, pray for the person. Uh, but we, we, we do judge the sin. So here, the lesson is forgiveness. Now, let's take a look at the uh, Luke 15. As, we, as we're looking at how can we love others as Jesus loved us. If you look at Luke 15, and uh, this is the prodigal son. Oh, I know that one. Why are we going there? I've heard it a long time. <laughs> uh, Luke 15, and verse 11. So here's the, here's the parable that Jesus is saying. And he's teaching, he's teaching us. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Now, here, here, we, see, we, here we see that uh, the, the father had love for this son. You know, how many fathers would, would do this, right? How many fathers would give you your inheritance, you know, before, before he dies? Uh, but this, this, this man had love for his son, and and because he had love for his son, he he didn't want he wanted to grant his request. He wanted to grant his request, and so he gave him his portion. And in not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal giving, living. He wasted things. Now how angry, how angry would you be as a father, right? Maybe you heard from other people what had happened, how angry you would have been, right? So when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, they began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. 
And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. See, this, this parable, is, this father figure is, is, is representing Jesus Christ. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. So what does that show? That shows a repentant attitude, right? And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Maybe you like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now how many of us as fathers would have, uh, you know, not even let him come back? You lousy. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> You know, if you didn't have the Spirit of God, you, you wouldn't even let him come back. But no, he, he ran out and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Mm -hmm. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. So we see here that the father had compassion on the son. The father had mercy on the son. He didn't condemn him. <coughs> the father had love on his son. Even after what the son had done, he still treated him with love. And the father had forgiveness on the son. And so these are lessons for us that we are to have compassion, mercy, love, and forgiveness. This is how we can love others as Jesus loved us. Yes. Serving others. Serving others. And unconditional love. This is an unconditional love. And because Jesus also tells us to love our enemies. But let's go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. And verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those <coughs> on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? When, when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Surely I say to you, insomuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. You did it to me. So, serving others. How can we love others as Jesus loved us? By serving others. Because Jesus served others. Yes. And here is an example. Here is the example. When we see somebody in need, if we're able to, we need we need to help them and not say, well, somebody else will do it, or I don't have time, or... Um, and, uh, you know, someone was saying to me the other day, because we have two, two people who uh, say that they believe in the doctrines of the Church of God, they believe in Jesus Christ, and they were both in prison. And once in Connecticut, he got out of prison. And uh, but somebody told me he did, he did some horrible things. Uh, 
terms of uh, sexual nature. And then uh, this other person is, uh, also is in prison right now for murder, this, uh, this person told me. And this person said, well, we, we shouldn't, uh, you know, the pastor was going to see them, particularly the one in Connecticut, quite a bit, and ministering to them, going into the prison. And this person said to me, oh, we shouldn't be seeing them, you know. Look what this person did, you know. Well, why are they in prison like that? We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be go uh, seeing them. And of course, uh, that's not correct because, uh, you know, if these people are, are they, they can repent, they can convert. Uh, yes, some will. Seems like a lot of the prison population seems to turn to Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it might not all be sincere. But certainly, we are to, 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 do, to do our part when we can, when we, uh, particularly if we're in a, in, a, uh, in a role as a pastor or, or even if it's somebody that we just know. You know, and people who are in need, uh, who are sick, certainly we should be visiting them or calling them. Um, people who are hungry, yes, uh, we should be whatever we can uh, helping people. Um, <clears throat> so this is what uh, Jesus expected. What about our enemies, though? Oh, surely God doesn't want us to love our enemies, right? Uh, no, no, Jesus, please, that's that's too much. Uh, you're asking too much. <laughs> uh, John five and verse forty three. John 5 verse 43 Jesus said you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy mm. so we see the old covenant that was pretty much the case right uh, you know God said go out and destroy the people around you but I say to you love your enemies bless those who curse you do good to those who hate you and pray for those who despise who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and says, rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward of you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Mm. And if you greet your brethren only, uh, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. And we tend to do that, right? We tend to be friendly with people we know, people at work, people in the congregation, but people outside, we might not be. Or certainly people that, uh, that, 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 that boss from hell at work, or co-worker who's always trying to undermine you, or your neighbor, your neighbor below, your, below, uh, below you in your apartment building who's always banging with his stick on the, on, the, on the ceiling because you're walking on your floor and you're, you're making too much noise or um, or people that are just trying to do you harm uh, maybe maybe because you uh, believe in Jesus Christ you know uh, maybe because you're a Christian so uh, but Jesus tells us to love our enemies and this is how this is how really um, we have to bless those who curse us. And, uh, you know, when you think about it, you pray for these people. You pray, you don't have to hang out with your enemies. You know? yeah. uh, mm -hmm. But you're commanded to love them. You're commanded to love them. Yes. yes. In a social and moral sense. And so what we do is we pray for them. We pray that God could change just their heart. God could, God could uh, can, uh, turn their hearts towards you. He can, uh, he can cause them to have a change of feelings. Um, and so we have to uh, and, 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 and pray for those who despitefully use you. But it also said to do good to those who hate you. So that boss, that, that boss from hell, you know, if you have a chance to... Uh, to do some good, you should do so. If you have a way, if you, if at work you, it's something you could do that can help the boss, this boss from hell, you should do it. And uh, in Romans, uh, if we go to Romans 12 and verse 14, Romans 12. Uh, 
in verse 14. Here Paul says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And how can we bless them? Well, we can bless them by, you know, being kind to them. Uh, a kind word turns away wrath. So if someone is cursing at you and screaming at you, you, you come with, back with them, at them with a soft voice. And uh, maybe a firm voice also, but a soft voice first. A voice. Um, and uh, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not care. And, and, and you know, we, we don't hold a grudge. We don't hold a grudge. In verse 20, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. <laughs> if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. <laughs> you want to get back at your boss, but you sure want to get back at. Him. Or you want to get back at this person? Be kind to them. <laughs> they can't. They, they can't handle it. They can't handle it. Be kind to them. If they're in need, if, if you know, if you're walking in the street and that boss from hell is lying on the street, don't just walk by. Help him, or his car broke down <laughs> and you're driving by. Um, you know, so we are to. Uh, to be kind and love even our, our, our enemies. Uh, and this is from Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. The idea of, you know, if the enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Because you will be heaping coals of fire on his head. And you know, the uh, Proverbs also says that uh, God could turn the heart of your enemies towards you. He could turn the heart. Sometimes he's not gonna necessarily deal directly with them, but by you being Christ-like, that will turn the, the man's heart. By you mm -hmm. not not responding in kind, but answering in a in a kindly manner, that can turn his heart. Um, God could, uh, could cause this, this man to a woman to respect you. And uh, if all else fails, God can have him transfer. Him or her transfer to the <laughs> God works in mysterious ways. So, if we turn to Philippians 4, verse 13. So, Jesus gave us a new commandment. As we said before, Jesus is the God of the Old Covenant. He gave the Ten Commandments in the form of the Word. He certainly has the authority to give a commandment. And He does in the New Covenant. I don't think we should call it the eleventh commandment, but yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I, I use that title to entice you. But it's certainly we could say it's a new commandment, and as a commandment, we can't ignore it. We can't ignore it. Um, Philippians so say so, and Jesus told us how to love others, as He loved us. And remember, it's not that's not the same as loving your neighbor as yourself. This is a higher love. To love others as I have loved you. And we saw the examples of Jesus Christ and how he loved others, how he served others, how he forgave others. And we saw through these teachings of the Good Samaritan, of mercy and compassion, of the woman caught in adultery, forgiveness, and of the prodigal son. Again, love, mercy, compassion, because that's. That's how God loves us. That's how God loves us. You say, I, I can't do it, I can't do it. Well, you can do it. Uh, Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, you can't do it, but you can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens you. Amen. And how, how does he strengthen you? He lives in you. Amen. He lives in you if you're converted. And even if you're not converted, but you're, you know, you're, you're going to be baptized and you've been coming and the Holy Spirit is working with you too. You know, he's working with people. He's calling people. He's working with people. He leads them to repentance. But when you're baptized, you have hands laid on, then you receive the Holy Spirit. And you don't, you don't necessarily feel any different, but 
you will see a change over time. Mm -hmm. And you have to believe that you have the Holy Spirit. And Philippians 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we can have the mind of Jesus Christ. So that's how we, well, we can love others, because Jesus is living in us, and we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, Romans uh, 5 and verse 5. Romans 5 and verse 5. Romans 5 and verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. The love of God has been poured out in your heart by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So when, all, when we receive the Holy Spirit, God's love is poured out into our hearts. Yes. Through His Holy Spirit. In John 14, as we wrap up, uh, John 14, and verse 15. John 14 and verse 15. Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And that's not just uh, the Ten Commandments. These are also the commandments that Jesus gives us in the New Covenant. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of Truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. So he's talking about the spirit of truth. He's saying, he, he, he's saying it's uh, describing it as a him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you off as I will come to you. So he's talking about himself. He's the spirit of truth. He's going to live in us through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And uh, Galatians 5, verse 22. So here's, here's what we need to love others as Christ loved us. This is what we need. And we have it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law Amen. and verse 26 let us not be conceited provoke okay let's see so these are the attributes that we have through the Holy Spirit and this is the equipment that we have if you will through the Holy Spirit that, that can enable us to love others as Jesus loved us. And in John 13, 34, 35, we'll end, this will be the last scripture. Uh, John 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. He's not just talking to the 12 disciples or how many there were there. He's talking about all of us too. If you have love for one another.